You know, I, I, uh, I think before I begin, I'd like to say that um, this kind of accidental, unwitting, and unwilling celebrity, uh, if it has any silver lining, perhaps it's that on nights like this, we could actually have a conversation about something really important and something really meaningful and, um, and have it in a way that we would have if we were 10 people sitting around a circle. And even though this venue doesn't lend itself to that, I encourage you to think about what you'd like me to talk about and what you'd like to talk about, and we'll end up, I think, in a dialogue in, in fairly short order. Um, before I begin, I, I, I'll just uh, hark back to um, the period right after 9-11. I had a book come out, and I had been scheduled to go on a 35-city book tour. And even though I couldn't fly the first week of, of that schedule, uh, once once I could go on book tour, I did, and I went to all 35 sites, most of them small independent bookstores, uh, like the independent bookstore that is sponsoring um, this event tonight. Um, so if you don't know Teaching for Change, and I, I assume you do, uh, or if you don't know Busboys and Poets, and I'm certain that most of you do, I want to just put a quick plug in for them because in our society, as the public space is eclipsing, is shrinking, it's important to note that independent bookstores are one place that sponsor evenings like this, that sponsor opportunities for people to come together and talk. And even if the coming together and talking is something that's um, difficult or something that's unpopular or something that's um, not completely in, in sync with your own thinking. It's the ability to come together and think and speak together that makes this public space very precious. And so, as I said on that book tour eight years ago, and I'll say it tonight, before you leave tonight, <clears throat> definitely buy a book. Don't buy my book. Buy any book, but buy a book to support this space and to support this invaluable bookstore, this resource, and to support busboys and poets. So I really urge you to take seriously our responsibility as a community um, to uh, support the institutions that allow us to have a conversation uh, in a way that so few places do anymore, including universities, which are part of the shrinking public space. So <clears throat> we can talk about a range of things, but I thought what I would talk about just to get us started was exactly where you left off, and that is uh, on the question of democracy and education and the important link between the two. Could I ask how many of you are teachers? How many of you are teachers? Okay, I don't even just mean being paid to teach. How many of you are teachers in your life? Come on, come on, come on. <clears throat> we're all teachers and we're all learners. I could say how many of you are students and I hope 100% of you uh, will agree that you are a student. I know I'm a student. I'm a 64-year-old student, and I'm still trying to figure out what to do next. Um, so I, I want us to kind of enter into a dialogue about teaching and learning, talk about the importance of teaching and learning in our lives, and, um, and I want to talk a bit about, about the schools and the crisis in education right now, and in some ways, um, this exciting moment um, of change, this exciting moment of where we can ask ourselves, we can kind of endorse the idea, yes, we can. Can I hear an amen? Yes, we can. <laughs> um, but yes, we can what? And part of what our responsibility is is to fill in that blank. Yes, we can what? I was telling Clarence Page earlier that uh, I was at Grant Park on November 4th, and I hope you were too. Um, I didn't see you, but I assume most of you were there, at least in spirit. And it was an exciting, um, unforgettable moment. You know, something that had been unimaginable just a short time before. And for those of us who were old, it's been unimaginable our whole lives. And then suddenly there it was, unforgettable, you know, un, uh, you know, inevitable in a certain sense. And the feeling in the crowd, and if you were in Lafayette Park, you got it. My son was in Harlem, another son was in downtown San Francisco. Um, if you were anywhere, uh, or if you just watched it on TV, or if you watched the world reaction the next day, which was exciting, um, my, my sister-in-law was in Cape Town, and, and one of my uh, relatives was in Paris, and uh, it was the same thing. But there we were in the biggest crowd, one of the biggest crowds I've ever been in, 
and I've been in a lot of big crowds, but this was the first big crowd I was in that wasn't edged with anger or drunkenness or gluttony or something like that. It was a, a crowd that was all joy, all unity, all love, all hope, and the, the, the feeling of relief was palpable that night. The feeling that, yes, we can, was everywhere. And then the question, yes, we can, what? Well, you were reading about 1965, so maybe I'll start in 1965 and talk a bit about teaching and link it a little bit to the question of democracy. And then, as I say, please fire away questions and comments and we'll get a dialogue going. As was noted, I began teaching in 1965 in a small little free school uh, affiliated with the civil rights movement. And I thought then, and I think now, that education is linked to the question of social justice. And the reason it is, is because education at its best is always an enterprise based on enlightenment and liberation. That is, it's based on the idea that we should know more, we should understand more, we should open our eyes more, we should pay more attention. And in opening our eyes and in paying attention, we should be able to do more. We should be more effective. We should be more powerful in our projects and in our pursuits. And in that way, we should be freer. We should be more capable of naming the obstacles before us and figuring out how to link up with other folks and do something about that. So I've thought from that first day that education is an instance or can be an instance at its best of working for social justice. And so social justice has become this kind of, um, this kind of uh, uh, slogan almost in the world of education. And, and people treat it as if it's almost an add-on, like we'll do social justice teaching as an add-on, like we'll do you know, uh, driver's ed and also social justice. But it's not that kind of thing at all. It's at the very heart of what education is at its best. It's at the very heart of thinking about education as an enterprise geared towards liberation and enlightenment. But before I get too lofty, I have to tell you that the first day of my first teaching assignment in kindergarten, um, I was about 15 minutes into my first day, I was 20 years old, and a five-year-old said to me, Bill, why does the ball bounce? And I thought, oh shit, <laughs> I don't even know that. You know, and, and I was, I was, here was a, I was only 15 minutes in, and I'd already been stumped because I, I, you know, and I'd gone in there with the idea that teaching, which we all kind of have somewhere vaguely in our minds, that teaching is an enterprise where the teacher knows and then tells the students the answers to things or, or, or kind of figures out what, how to kind of meet out knowledge in an orderly and, and linear way. So here I was 15 minutes in and I didn't know I was over my head. Why does the ball bounce? It's now 40 years later. I still don't know why the ball bounces, which is a little frightening if you think about it. You would think I could find out between now and then. Actually, well, a physicist tried to explain it to me, but it, it didn't get, it didn't penetrate. Um, in any case, by noon of that first day, my ignorance was well known to all of my students. It wasn't just why does, the ball, why does the ball bounce that I didn't know the answer to? I didn't know why my skin was pink and her skin was brown. I didn't know, um, you know, I, the one thing I remember knowing that first day is why the floor got sticky when the apple juice spilled. And I thought, I felt so relieved that I actually knew something. We walked to the park and somebody wanted to know, why is that man sleeping on the street? Should we call somebody to help him? I didn't know why he was sleeping on the street. And suddenly I was over my head in a, in a territory that was frightening to me. And that crisis of that first day turned out to be quite productive for me as a teacher because I had to decide early on what kind of teacher I was going to be. Was I going to be the master and commander standing at the podium, hold, gripping it with all my might, searching for the answers, or saying that kind of squirrely response that teachers get into? Of, it, we'll get to that later. Um, you know, we'll cover that next year, or ask your mother. Um, you know, that's, that's a kind of a, a failure of imagination. It's a failure of courage, because teaching requires us, if you think of it a different way, if you think of it not as the master and commander, and you begin to think of it as being on a voyage with the students, if you think of it as being side by side rather than over,